life is what you are happy getting up for and if you're not happy then there's only one person that can be something about it and that is you and in today's episode of blue green museum we we'll meet and talk to a person who lives by his motto and whose life has been inspiring to many in many ways it's paul cronenberg co-founder of kandari international a non-profit organization which offers leadership programs to people who are keen to drive ethical social change being a person who is very passionate about eco-friendly technology and architecture let's listen to paul's transformation from being an engineer to a social change engineer before getting into the questions a warm welcome to blue green museum paul uh, me and my colleagues are here with you arati and i am anjana raj we are very honored to equally and equally excited to have you with us today thank you so um, we know you might have encountered this question more than once but kandari is a name that strikes a note in every malayali mind so how did you come up with that name and what inspires you to begin kandari with your co-founder sabri but well, it's two questions one is the kandari why kandari and why did we want to start this or why are we doing what we're doing um well the kandari came about um, many years ago um we were having lunch in sabri we were sitting on the you can see it from here we were sitting on the gallery that's like the extended uh, terrace of the auditorium and we were having lunch and our project at that time our organization was called the international institute for social entrepreneurs and that was a terrible name <laughs> way too long doesn't fit on a hat and t-shirt and stuff and so suddenly sabria um she took a bite of whatever we had for lunch and suddenly she was shouting she was standing up and she's like Whoa. what's this what's this and then our colleague they were laughing at and they said ah oh, that's just a kantari and so we became interested in what that kantari is and so we studied it and we found out that it's the perfect symbol for a change maker because a small chili can make a huge difference and so we transferred that you know the quality of that kantari as a chili as a very very spicy chili that has medicinal values that lowers your blood pressure purifies your blood we transfer that to people and like the kandari uh, that grows wild in the backyard of society we found that there are many many change makers out there that are just in wild in the society wild in the backyard of society and so we said okay we're going to provide them in a institute where they have a vision of creating a social impact within their own communities and we train people that are affected by social ill because of that they are very intrinsically driven to make a difference within their communities and what we do is we it's very simple we say okay you know what change society needs we just give you the tools so that's why we run kantari at kantari we train social visionaries uh, they come here for 7 months we provide them skills and tools so that after that they go back to uh, you know to their own communities and create a change from within that's very important Oh that's very interesting. <laughs> I enjoyed the story though. So you always mention Kandari as a dream factory, a place where people can identify their true calling and achieve it. So how do you help them connect with their aspiration as well as with the environment? So again, two questions, right? <laughs> so it's uh, so the the dream factory came about when we we run an organization called Braille Without Borders. We started this in Tibet. and i have to go back a little bit in the history to understand what brill with our boys and also what kantari is all about um when we started in 1998 long time ago in tibet we had uh, children that came literally from a dark room and so it was sabria was in 1997 when i met sabria first she went through tibet found a lot of blind children they were locked away in dark rooms uh they were left to die uh they couldn't speak couldn't walk when they were 4 5 years of age so sabri understood she said i i need to do something and but she said okay what is that specific thing so luckily on one of her trips on horseback through tibet she found uh, tenzin and tenzin at that time he was only 8 years old or 9 years old and uh, he was he was saying like oh you're blind i'm blind too and so sabri was wondering because the other children she saw they had no self confidence they were 
down, they were not communicating. And here is this boy that has this passion. And she asked him, so what, what you know, um, how, how, what do you do, right? Because in, in daily life, because she, he was different from the other ones that were just, you know, vegetating away in a room. And uh, he said, uh, well, I'm the yak herder in my village. And so here comes something essential. And this goes back to everyone. He had a task, right? Because of this task, he had a value. If you have value, you're respected. And if you're respected, you get dignity. And only if you have that, then self-confidence can come. So a lot of people, they don't come to this level of dignity or respect because they are not respected. Society, parents, brothers, sisters, they all tell them that they are losers. You cannot do this, you're a loser. And look at look in India, right? Look at Kerala. Kerala was the number one suicide um, uh, state uh, amongst youth and students because, you know, they kill themselves. Um, we had a, a girl across the lake here who killed herself because she came second in class. The pressure is enormous, right? So at that point when Sabri understood, wow, this, this Tenzin, he put, he put it right. He said, well, we need to be given a chance to grow, to get value, right? To, to become self-confident, to have dignity, and then with that new one, dignity go back into society. So this was the idea for Sabri to start this project, Prayer Without Borders. I met Sabri in 97. In 98, she called me up and I decided to join her. So the next day I quit my job. We went to, back to Tibet and then we started this. The major problem we had at that point was how can we give hope for these children in the future? And that's how we came up with the Dream Factory. So that's where we started the original Dream Factory. So we said the most important thing in life, I, I still feel that it's one of the most, or if not the most important thing in life, is to dream. And unfortunately, dreams have a negative connotation with other people. They say, ah, stick, you know, stay on the ground, don't grab for the stars, it's not possible. There's a lot of people that, that stop other people from dreaming, and that's something we shouldn't. So we asked our children at that time, um, please dream about what it is that you want to do. Right? And not what you have to, but what you want to do, right? There's a very magical saying. It says, if I have to, becomes I want to. That's where the magic begins. That's true for everyone, right? Only if you do what you really love doing, you will enjoy it. And how many people, if you go around and you ask them, what do you do? They will start with, well, they have two answers, right? One, I have to go to school. Two, I have to go to work. <laughs> and that's terrible, right? So... So these are, you know, we have plenty of thank, you know, thank God it's Friday people. You probably know them, right? So they are Friday weekend, two days, and then, you know, they forget about everything. But on Monday, the same routine starts again. So we asked our children, we said, we want you to dream what it is that you want to do. So we gave him a couple of weeks. And here's Nobu, eight years old, and he shares his dream. He says, I want to become a taxi driver. <laughs> so he's only, you know, a little kid, doesn't know. And we could have destroyed his dream right there and then, but we don't have the right to do that. And nobody has a right to destroy anyone's dream. So we said, wonderful. And we let him out. He was happy, happy kid. You know, two years after we had another dream factory, then we asked our, our same kids again, so what about the status of your dreams? Nobu, what has happened? He said, well, now I realize the fact I can't see, maybe it's not so good to become a taxi driver, but I can set up a taxi company and run it. He's 10 years old. He never did that, but two years after that, he flew. He was the first blind person ever in Tibet to fly. He flew all the way to Tibet, uh, to Holland, learned how to make cheese, came back, started our cheese factory, and trained uh, you know, many blind people in making cheese. Now, this is like 20 years ago, now he's running a restaurant and a, and a medical massage clinic. And why is he successful? Because he does what he loves doing. That's as simple as it is. So basically here, the same concept happens. Kantari is a dream factory for people that have, they have a dream to create a, you know, to address a social issue. And when they come to Kantari, we provide them with the tools so they can change that dream into a real project, into a real NGO, into an organization that makes that impact that's required within their community and of which they are part of their own target group. So blind people are going to do something for, with blind people. We have orphans that are doing something with orphans. We have ex-child soldiers that are empowering ex-child soldiers. We have women that have been raped who are, you know, doing something for the women that have faced domestic violence and rape. So it, the change comes from within. That's very, very important. That's key. So then the environment part. <laughs> how do we, how does that connect to the environment? Um, see, 
we are one, I, I, what I don't understand is the stupidity of mankind. The only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. They made so many mistakes already. And we see what, you know, the wave of the terrible buildings that have been built in the West in the 50s, 60s, after the war, you know, these high sky rises, you know, like these, these, it's terrible. And we can do so much better. We can do so much better. We are the biggest, the biggest, uh, pro, uh, for me, the biggest, uh, I would say, um, obstacle for progress are we ourselves. Because we don't give a lot of thought of what it is that we want or should build. And we need to build buildings that last for hundreds and hundreds of years. But right now, the tendency is we want to make profit or the builders want to make profit. So the high rises that you see here in Turandum as well, they're not going to last for 20, 30, 40 years. They're going to collapse after 20 years because then we can build new ones. And that's incredibly stupid. So I want to, I, I, this, this one example I share with every talk I give. And this is the, the stupidity of mankind. And I would like to share that with you. There are two people that are sitting on a bench and they have a big discussion about alien life. So one says to the other one, he says, well, I'm 100% sure that up in space, there is a very advanced alien life. The other guy says, how can you be 100% sure? We've never met. He says, exactly. So they came with their spaceship. They parked their spaceship on the side of our globe. They looked at our planet and they said, wow, mind-boggling, beautiful. The other alien said, well, wait, wait. He says, I study this planet and, you know, look at this planet and you see those people, you know, those creatures there, they call people. And, well, they go into shops and they buy these little packages with cigarettes that says smoking kills. So the other alien, he says, wait, they're all suicidal? He said, I don't know, but they do it. And they keep doing it despite the morning. <laughs> then they have these places where they put borders around. And they call them countries. And here's one country that bought last year, they spent billions and billions of dollars on the production of weapons. So the other alien says, so what aliens are they defending themselves against? And he says, not aliens, people, other people. So it's, it's mind boggling, right? And then they zoomed in and they saw at the equator level, poor people digging in the earth, collecting bits and pieces of gold. And they would melt it into little bars and they would melt it into bigger bars. And what, of course, only rich people can own these very big gold bars. And guess what happens with them? They put them back in the ground in the safe. <laughs> and that's the model that we are used to, right? That's the model that we are taught as a child you're successful when you gain stuff when you you know you get more and more and more and never you know what is and it's never enough and that's a problem so going back to the the thought of you know and, and connection to nature and environment is that fact you know it's, it's a very factual thing without nature we can't live so what do we want do we want to extinct ourselves right or do we want to come up with you're looking at solutions of how we can coexist. And we definitely can coexist because this is what the tribal communities worldwide have proven for hundreds and hundreds of years without, you know, fancy technology. They had very basic technology and tools, but they, they were able to live in harmony with nature. And right now what we're doing, we are, you know, destroying our planet by just raping Mother Earth. That's what we're doing, right? And that's something that we should all, and with common sense, I don't think that there is common sense because if common sense would be there, then most of the people on the planet would act accordingly. But unfortunately, they're not. I do think that there is a sense, but it has to become common, <laughs> right, for it to work so that people understand we all are responsible. You're responsible for what you choose to do, but you're also responsible for what you choose not to do. And that's where the problem lies. A lot of people, they look away. They look away. And looking away is the easiest solution. Not my problem. Uh, trash here in Kerala, not in my backyard. Over the wall, right? That's the thing. It happens everywhere. Not my problem. Well, it is our problem. It's all our problem, right? We are all one on this, this one, you know, precious planet that we have. And we should work all together. And it's possible. It is definitely possible with technology. But we have to understand first you know, that we have to get away from the not my responsibility. It's only one straw, say 8 billion people. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> I think the idea of not my problem has to be implanted in everybody's mind. Like, it's not, my, they always think it's not my problem. I think we have to implant that idea in everybody's mind that everything is my problem. 
Avenue. It's a, I, I'll give you one example, and this is one uh, example of one of our graduates. Um, so we had An uh, Anumutu came here, and Anumutu was, when he was five years old, he lost his father, and he became a child laborer. And he had a terrible youth. Luckily, he was picked up from, you know, from his, he was freed from his child labor um, by an NGO. They put him into a school. He became a graphic designer. And uh, at some point, he, he noticed there's a lot of homeless people in Pondicherry. And he really had a big heart for the, you know, for the homeless. And he started an organization called Sneham, friend of all. And when he came here, we said, well, there's one issue because we like to work with people that are part of that target group. And we said, well, you've been poor, you had a terrible youth, but you were never homeless. So, you know, if you have been homeless, how do you feel? Because otherwise there's an approach that you come from the top, you come down and you, you know, like, are you poor thing? And it becomes a kind of a charity approach. Charity is not a good thing, right? Empowerment is a good thing. Charity is making people more dependent on one particular group or an NGO, and then people never get independent. Independence is the goal, right? I'm from Netherlands where when we're 18, our parents kick us out of our house, if we want or not. <laughs> we have to learn how to cook. We have to learn how to, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we can survive, that we're able to do that, right? And I just read a, um, just last week, I saw a little clip on the World Economic Forum, is that the Dutch youth are, in that sense, most independent. <laughs> Well, because the parents just take, they dump them out of the house, right? Here it's the opposite. Here they, the parents, they take care of you till, well, till you're not definitely not a child anymore. They still take care of you, right? So you should be able to stand on your own two feet. So Anamutu um, said, okay, I, I will go on the street. I will try this just to get the experience. So he went on, you remember Ochi, right? The big uh, storm cyclone that came in 2017. Uh, right before Christmas, it was a couple of weeks before Christmas, and he went on the street on Friday. We sat here, right here in the office, and we discussed with him. We said, well, is it going to be safe? And you, know, you have to warn the police that they not arrest you. Um, you know, in case of an emergency, you know, are you going to take a phone? He said, no, I'm not going to take a phone, nothing. He took 10 rupees that he taped on his body. He put some old rags on. He went on the street. He was very, you know, proud, and he said, I'm going to do this. Three days later, he came back. <laughs> And again, he was sitting here and he was crying. He was crying. And I said, what happened? He said, well, in the last three days, he said, I've never been so hungry, so thirsty and so cold. He said, but that was not a problem. He said, I became invisible. And on average, there were about 3,000 people that walked through that railway station every hour, day and night. And he was not being noticed. And that's the problem. People chose to look away. Right? And that's a choice. And that's a choice that we all make. And I, I'm guilty of it as well. In the past, I've looked, looked away because I, at that point as well, I couldn't handle, didn't know what to do. Now, at least, right, we have to talk to those people, even if we don't give them something, but we can talk to them. We have to make sure that they still feel that they are human beings and not something else, right? So, and this is the thing. And, and that's where the connection comes in. We're all responsible, right? We're all, it's all, we're all on one planet. Nobody lives in a different world. We're all in that same world, but we make the difference. We separate by caste, by money that you have, by skin color, which is terrible, right? It's, it, there's, there's a lot of silly things out there, right? But we don't get, I came to India and, you know, people have these whiteness, right? They want to look like us. But when we look at us, we come to India to get some of your son to look like you. <laughs> and then people start with fair and lovely. <laughs> It's, it's a weird world. And we have to accept of you are you. You have to, you know, accept who you are. We did this campaign a couple of years back, many years back. And it was the you are you campaign. And it was, it was very good because there were two black Africans and rather dark skinned South Indians. And they came up with a new cream. And the cream was named Fair Enough. <laughs> it's just a moisturizer. So no whitening cream, nothing. And they went into the city and they started selling it next to, I think, Spencer it was. And within a few minutes, there was this big riot going on. People, you know, nearly fist fighting uh, on, you know, the, the, the use of creams in the skin color. But it shows how ridiculous it is that we want to look like somebody else. You're unique like everybody else. <laughs> so you should celebrate your uniqueness. But we're all responsible for who we are on this planet together, sharing what we have. And I think that's something that I, I wish we could instill that more in anyone, right? Um, the story of stuff is a little um, uh, video clip that I think everyone should see, right? So it's about sharing. It's about the, the, the cycle. Well, it's not a cycle. It's a one linear process of how we excavate, you know, then we produce, then we put a lot of 
you know, poisons in it and then we trash it and we burn it and we, we basically are killing our planet. And that's a film I think I would recommend to everyone, The Story of Stuff, Annie Leonard, brilliant film. <laughs> Uh, talking about Netherlands, you hail from Netherlands, a country where there is like more than two thirds water. And the campus of Kantari is also in the banks of Velaini Lake, which is the biggest freshwater lake in Kerala. Mm. Is there any parallel you can draw between the technology and connection with water in both places? So as you mentioned, two thirds of Netherlands is water. That's not completely true. It's like one third of the land is below the sea level. <laughs> So in Holland, let's see, I think it's one of the few places in the world where you can actually drive, uh, ride a bicycle and you just go on and then you look up and you see a boat passing way above you in the river because the rivers are higher than the land, which is scary for a lot of foreigners when they first come because they think like, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's a tsunami, <laughs> nothing's going to drown. Um, the Dutch are very tall as well and this is evolution because every morning the first thing we do is we look across the dike to see if the water is coming in over the years that made us taller. So, <laughs> so the, the relationship, well, first of all in Holland, you, if you, you are forced to love water because when you're three or four years old, you have to learn how to swim, which is, I think it's a great thing. And then they should definitely do that here as well in that way, because, you know, a lot of people drown here because they can't swim. And there's plenty of water here. And look at the floods now, right? The floods have gotten worse in the last few years. So swimming is a great thing to have. I love water. I love to be in it. Actually, it was last night. Every day we're going to the lake to clean it. Um, the, the thing about, um, we have to, of course, water has a lot of, water is life, uh, first of all. And water has a lot of advantages, but there's also dangers to it, right? And the danger is, like I mentioned, it's flooding. Um, the, of course, floating houses, uh, we had a, a little floating island here to make that, uh, we had a, we called it the turquoise island, it was shaped like a turtle, and we had a little house on it, made it from bamboo, and of course, every flood we had here, that thing was always, you know, on top of it. <laughs> and that's a very simple um, uh, technique that can be used for houses, for f villages, floating villages. Uh, there are so many things that we can do with that, and we should. I think the biggest issue in, in Kerala that I've seen when the floods come in and, and where flooding got worse in the last few years, well, flooding has always been there, but because of the, you know, the amount of people that are living in Kerala, the population is getting more dense and dense. We started to, to build in areas that are prone to flooding. So of course we should not, you know, uh, scratch our head and go like, oh, you know, uh, I didn't know there was water here. Of course there's water. Water has to get out, right? So we have to make, and, and this is the thing that I, I would like to, well, which would also be good to be discussed more, is what can we do during the seven, eight months, nine months a year when it's not raining, right? What can we do during that time to prepare in the best possible way? And even if we have houses in, pro, in, in flood areas, you know, that we can still have there, but what can we do to guide the water away, right, when it comes? And even better than that, what can we do to store it? Because we should not let that very valuable water run away, right? If that goes straight from the mountains back into the ocean, we've lost because look what nature gave us, right? They gave it all that water. So we have to try to find ways, you know, while rainwater harvesting is, should be compulsory everywhere, especially looking forward, right? That's, that's one thing. So rainwater harvesting, we have to make proper channels for guiding the water in, especially in, in hilly areas, so that once, you know, the rains come, and we know that they come every year, and it's getting worse every year, apparently, right? It's getting, there's higher volumes in a shorter period of time. So what can we do to make sure that that water is being guided into channels where we can either keep it up in, in lakes, fill up lakes, or create artificial, uh, you know, storage spaces for that same water? Next question is, like, are there any specific eco-friendly open hardware technology that you're particularly interested in? Like, we really love to know about it. Um, first of all, I think that any, any solution that is, you know, eco-friendly, that makes sure that we are um, working on sustainable solutions should be shared. That should be open hardware. It should not be patented uh, in whatever um, uh, version, because I think that if 
if we don't, you know, we, we need a rapid change to get to a more sustainable model in general, worldwide, uh, to make that turn around. And if one company comes up with a technology and sits on it and other people cannot copy that, that one company will not be able to provide it for the entire world. So we need to come up with solutions that are there. But we can look at you know, technology that is available already um, going back centuries in time, which is free, right? Very, one, one very simple thing is um, uh, the rising air. Hot air rises, everybody knows that, right? And then we smart people come up with a solution that when the air is getting trapped at the ceiling, we put in a fan and then we blow down that hot air. <laughs> that's absolutely silly and of course I've never seen in, in India I don't know or in Asia in general when I walk into a room and there's a fan on it's never on speed one it's always on speed five and I know why they have these regulators because you know when somebody says oh turn on the fan and immediately goes like right and the the amount of you know heat that the fan produces when it's on you know maximum speed is adding to the heat that's in the room already so after an hour in that room with a fan the whole room is hotter <laughs> that's a very you know for me it's mind-boggling why we keep putting that kind of stuff right so in our um, uh, auditorium we gave it a different approach and we said well we have the hot air that has to get out in the top so we have to have holes in the ceiling so the, it's like an arch, semi-arch uh, building, and in the top there is, you know, we have openings, so the hot air gets not stuck at the ceiling, it gets out. And we have a roof on top of that where the wind usually comes from the lakeside. So when the hot air is going out, instead of having the wind blowing it back, it's, the wind is taking that away, so there will be a motion of air. And of course, on the side of the building, we have jolly walls that are open where you know air comes in or there's an airflow automatically and of course the the air that is in the lower part is cooler than the one in the top so you have a constant flow of air it can be done anywhere right so we could start with that there's a beautiful building in in zimbabwe it's called the east gate mall and that is built like a because the idea comes from nature and it comes from from the um, uh, small little termites the termite hills they build buildings that are you know thousands of times bigger than themselves Themselves. they have lots and lots of small little rooms in it and they're all air conditioned and there's no switch <laughs> that's something that we can learn from right it's a uh, second thing is well we, we are looking at um, uh, that's a big issue very big issue and people don't speak about it and that's toilets we have a beautiful resource it's a renewable resource I just went actually in the break I used to <laughs> go quickly to the toilet and so it's a resource we don't speak about and that's our waste but there's no waste waste is not existing on our planet right we waste is a resource at the wrong place right so we have our feces we have our urine and both can be used and unfortunately what we use it for is to pollute water with all our water closets that we have the western great technology and you know the channels to take that shit away right literally to take the shit away to wherever and it costs a lot of you know energy and it costs a lot of water to get that little portion of shit transported all the way and it's not sustainable because look at the canalization it costs it's a lot of money to upkeep you know to to keep it working you saw this video probably in london where this massive pile of fat you know this block of like tons of fat was in the in the canals obstructing you know the way the free flow of the shit and the urine so what we came up with here in our campus is ecosan Ecosan is a, you know, it's a wonderful model. It's a very simple model. You split the liquids from the solids. And look at how we are designed. We have two exits, one for the liquids and one for the solids. If you're healthy, it's supposed that way. But what are we doing? We're putting it together in one pot. And that's, that's a problem because when the urine comes together with the feces, that's where the bacteria can thrive because we feed them. So if we keep that separate, right, the urine, we keep it separate in a tank. We leave it for a month. Then we fill up another tank. We have two big tanks here. And we use the urine that is then after one month, which is completely dead, no more bacteria, nothing in it, everything's dead. And we dilute it with water and we use it for fertilizer for our trees. That everyone can do. You don't even have to touch it because you can collect it in a way in a canister. But you don't even have to touch it because that's a big issue uh, also in India, right? In Asia, we're touching the feces or the urine. The feces also, we don't touch them here because they are automatically going into our biogas. So when we flush, it's less water that we use, and they go directly into our biogas system. And the next day, we, of course, we cook from what we 
you know, wasted yesterday. And that's a good thought. Uh, rainwater harvesting, we have the, cooling through rain, through water as well. There's, there's air conditioning through, uh, you know, using water in your buildings. Um, there's so many things that we can use. And I think, see, we build in a Laurie Baker style. Um, unfortunately, Laurie Baker, it was only about, you know, basically cost effective. But back then, when he was designing his buildings, the environment didn't play that big of a role yet, right? So we said, okay, let's let's take that as a basic model, but add some, you know, technology so we can make sure that, um, you know, it's it's going to last for a long time, but it's also eco-friendly. And one thing that uh, Laurie Baker was uh, big about was no, don't construct with materials that are further than a radius of like 15 kilometers or 30 kilometers, something like that. You know, because the materials should come from close from nearby, which I think is a fantastic thing. We should adapt to the landscape and not, we first flatten all the landscape and then put our buildings. Right? that's another thing that we can do. We build here with mud. Our first building on the right side when you walk in is the largest mud construction in Kerala in the last 30 years. And we built that more than 10 years ago. And I'm, I'm sad that not more people are using that. Mud is a fantastic material. It breathes, you know, there's, it's, it's alive, basically, in that sense. Um, it doesn't store heat uh, all that much as concrete does. And concrete, of course, if you have a concrete house, the sun heats it up during the day. And at night, of course, that heat is being radiated inside of your house, which is terrible. Right? It's, and that's why people always say, like, oh, it's so hot. Well, it's, you're making it hot. <laughs> and then they put a fan, of course, to make it even hotter. <laughs> that's the thing. So, yeah, there's many. I think we should just, you know, before anyone starts to build a house, and I think this should be compulsory, every new building that we make should be built in such a way that it is environmental friendly, that it's, it's sustainable, that it's going to last for a long, long time. These are a few things that <laughs> maybe are helpful, I don't know. All right, Paul, that was a really interesting thing. And it was nice to listen uh, to your point of view on these issues. So since you had uh, mentioned about uh, the floods, the recurring floods that's been happening in our state over the years, and you also mentioned we are the reason behind it. Uh, and uh, climate change and sustainable living is a relevant topic in very much in discussion these days. And to an extent, the exploitation that the planet faces today can be linked with the anti-green construction techniques that we employ. So how do you think uh, the way of construction can make a change in saving the environment, especially in relation with houses in Kerala, since you're based in Kerala? What is your opinion on that? Yes, I'm, I, I like the question. <laughs> um, see, the, the thing is, there's a beautiful documentary, and I think everyone should see that. It's called The End of Ownership. The End of Ownership. It's VPRO. We can, maybe you can mention the link underneath the video later on. The End of Ownership talks about the following. It's a very simple uh, thing. Um, see, we need to build in such a way that we can reuse the materials at a later stage. Right now, we don't do that. And I'll, I'll tell you the End of Ownership an example. The example is about lights. You all know light bulbs. And I'm sure that in your life, you must have changed a light bulb or two or more, probably, right? And when you took out the light bulb that was broken, you can see that the little coil was gone, right? And what did you do with it, with this thing? You threw it. Why? Because it was worthless. It served its purpose, it broke, and you threw it. So now, there is a light bulb in the US that's been on for more than 100 years. Day and night, 24-7, it has been burning for more than 100 years. So more than 100 years ago, they knew to make something that's going to last a long, long time. But then, of course, the model of you know, capitalism came in, in their way of how to make money. So if I'm going to sell everybody a light bulb that lasts for 100 years, I don't sell light bulbs anymore. So they came up with a solution for that. They made it break after a certain amount of time. So, and we accepted that a light bulb lasts for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hours, and then it, boing, it goes and we just throw it. And we don't even think about it. So now here's a person that went to Philips. Philips is the large uh, manufacturer of light bulbs in, the, in Holland. And so he said, I want to buy light from you. And Philips said, uh, yeah, which one? He said, no, no, not which one. I want to buy light, lux, the actual, you know, light. 
He said, how, what do you mean? He said, um, well, I want to buy light. I have a light meter. I put that in my office on three or four places. And after a month, I can see how much light you gave me. And they still didn't get it. They said, like, so what do you mean? He said, well, you could come to my place. You install your lights. They belong to you. You pay for the electricity. And at the end of the month, I'll pay you an amount of the amount of light that I got from you, that I measured. And Phillips, they were like laughing. They said, like, nah, that's not going to work. One guy said, okay, wait, let me do the calculations. So a couple of weeks afterwards, he went back and he said, uh, who pays for electricity? He said, you. Who owns the light bulb? You. Uh, what about the you know, electricity, everything, you know, the, the installation? You. I just buy light from you. It's a service. And then he said, okay, you're on. So Philips has lights that go for 50, 100, 200,000 hours, easy, without maintenance. What they sell us, there is something tweaked because they have a driver in an LED light, and you know with the LED lights that you got, they also break. And it's not the LED light itself, it's the driver. So you have to buy a driver, but to get that into your light because they put it way back in there, very difficult. So most of the time when you try to open it, you break the thing and you have to buy a whole new one. So now Philips came up with this and they said, okay, well, they have these lights that go for a long time. they maintenance free. So now per month, they get a certain amount of revenue and they own the light bulb. So now they have to think about 10 years because it's a lease project for 10 years. They have to think about what are they going to do with the material that are in that light bulb after 10 years. See, now at this time, most manufacturers, they don't care where, you know, once they sold whatever they produce, it's gone. And it's not their worry anymore. Now they have to worry. And basically, the light bulb becomes a storage of the materials that are inside that light bulb. So they created a material passport. And they said there's X grams of copper, there's X grams of whatever, uh, you know, is in that light bulb. So that they knew exactly what they were storing in that light bulb for the next 10 years. And they knew where it was. And then after 10 years, they have to take it back. And they have to already think now, what can we do after 10 years with that same light bulb? Can we do it and lease it out for another 10 years? What would it take to either repair or change it or put a new cap on it for another 10 years? So now you see that instead of the linear production process, where at the end it becomes trash, has changed, right? Because now the owner remains the factory. So what does it mean for the owner? it means a lot less of new materials coming in into this process, right? Because they get the old products back and it becomes more of a circular economy. And that's where we have to go. We have to go into a circular economy. So how does that translate to buildings and our campus as well? We have a hut out here as an example. It's Nabula. It's a beautiful little hut. It's a bamboo hut. And at some point, you know, like the storm came and it collapsed. So we said, you know, we're going to make a steel frame inside of it. But instead of welding it, what we're going to do, we're going to bolt it. So at one point when either, you know, we don't need the hut anymore, right? Or we have to, we, we want to move it. We want to move it to another place. We can unbolt it and we can move it. And that's the thing. I think that's a, the, the future of technology. I'm a big fan of Legos. I, when I was 11 years old, I worked the whole summer um, and I bought a technical Lego helicopter. I played with that thing for like a couple of weeks and then afterwards I got bored. But then I took away, you know, took it out took it, it's a separated and the next day I could build a car with it. And a couple of days after that, I took it apart again and I could build a house with it, right? And this is the thing. This is something that we have to look at. And I give this as a challenge. We get lots of uh, architect students every year that come here to our campus. Um, and I always give them the same challenge. I said, why can't we, why can't you think of a universal brick that we can, that is, that is made of renewable materials. And when, uh, uh, you know, pe people in the villages, when they get children, they move, you are in the city as well, they move to a bigger house. And when the children are out of the house, at some point they move back to a smaller house. Every day there's millions of people doing that, every day, worldwide. So now imagine you have people in the village, they just build up a second floor with these universal bricks. And once the kids go out of the house, they go like, here, take your bricks with you. Take your room with you, <laughs> right? Because they can take it, just take it apart and put it up somewhere else. I think that's the future of building. We need to build modular. And in a way that it's much easier to take things apart, to exchange, to extend, to make it smaller. You know, like that, that's the flexible building. That's what we should uh, focus on the future. On Watch the documentary, The End of Ownership. <laughs>
All right, yeah, we surely will watch the documentary for more. So, uh, <laughs> since you already mentioned about the uh, the construction uh, that we use, we're supposed to be using in future, that is modular. And uh, let's get back to your campus. We are we are literally over the pictures of your campus. It's really beautiful. Uh, we can feel the ambience just by looking at the pictures. So how the viewer, our viewers would love to hear about the construction of your campus. What all are the eco-friendly aspects did you look into while you know building it? And finally, uh, along with that, we would also like to know what you would like to, you know, uh, what advice you would give the youth today? Yes. In, in which regard? In, in general or in, on, when it comes to building or building their future? Uh, I think in general would be fine. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, well, our campus. See, we we build a um, a farm in Tibet, and we build a school for the blind in Tibet. And the the challenge back then, we had a farm. It was forty acres, four thousand meters altitude. And the challenge was, of course, how can we create this in such a way that it's you know in harmony with nature. So we we quickly came up. Of course, we need a, a water household. Water is a you know that's that's where it start, it all starts with, right? So if you have water available on a plot. You have to create a household that is circular within that plot, right? So you have a toilet that uses water. You flush the toilet. It goes either into a septic tank or into biogas or whatever. And then the overflow goes back into a filter, goes back to your groundwater. That's the natural way. And that's how we keep water in a particular place. What we're doing in the cities is we transport that water through channels far, far away. And that's not, that's not sustainable in the long run. Um, we said, okay, what, what can we do? First thing is, if you, you know, we started a dream factory also for our campus. Sabri and I, we were sitting with a friend, Naveen Ramachandran, who's from Nidumangat. And we sat at his house um, in Nidumangat many years ago. And we said, okay, what is it exactly that we want, right? So first we said, okay, we want to create this, this international training center. Um, how many spaces do we need? What do we need the spaces for? And how should the campus be like? And see, here is the, the, the nicest thing of, if you have an idea and you want to transfer that into a real, you know, building a campus, a, you know, any space, anything is possible because you haven't started building yet, right? So you should, first of all, not limit yourself and say, okay, I need a space of X square feet. And then you go into the city and you see what's there for rent and you rent it, and then you sit in that box. And that's already the wrong start. A lot of companies, they're not, you know, the, the, the employees, they're not very happy because they're locked up in boxes. And then the managers, they say, you have to think outside of the box. But how can you, if you're in a cubicle, in a square room, in a layered, in a, you know, many multi-layered building that has square rooms, that all together is also a square box. <laughs> think outside of the box, right? So. The first thing, if you design anything, if it's your personal house as well, it should fit your personality. So it's at that time, we were lucky. Um, I read a book about Laurie Baker, and it was all past tense. Laurie Baker did, he was, he, so I thought he did. <laughs> and then somebody said, no, no, he's still alive. And I said, oh, great, where is he? He said, well, into random. I said, wonderful, but let's go and meet him. And he said, no, no, his wife Elizabeth, he, she doesn't let anyone come close because he's sick and he's in his late 80s. And I said, well, we didn't even call yet. So we stopped on the side of the road. We asked for a telephone book and he was in the telephone book. So we picked up the phone, called him up. I got his wife on the phone. I explained in five minutes what we were post, what we wanted to do here in, in Trivandrum. And then she said, when can you come and meet us? And I said, right now. <laughs> so one half hour later, we were sitting at the table with Laurie and his wife. And we explained what we have done in Tibet. We explained what we wanted to do here in Kerala. And uh, then he said, oh, you should have come 10 years earlier because, you know, I like your project, would love to work with you. But here's my, my um, you know, successor, uh, which is a sergeant uh, from, uh, sergeant, uh, from Kostva. So then we sat with sergeant and, uh, and his wife. And for three and a half days, we discussed. We didn't draw a line on paper yet because we first discussed about what it is that we want, right? And if you build something where you have to be a lot of, we spend a lot of time. I'm here day and night, basically. Well, the nights we go back to sleep at home with, for the rest from early morning to late evening, we're here, right? The participants, they stay on campus. Our colleagues are on campus, right? So it should be a, a, a wonderful place to be. 
So, and how can you make it wonderful? Well, to adapt it to nature, to make sure that you, you I'm literally sitting outside right now. I'm sitting inside, but the windows here are wide open. There's no air conditioning as such because we have buildings that are made out of mud. They're cool already, right? So that's, that's an important aspect. We have hardly any square uh, room. Most of the rooms here are di different in shape. Very organic. We have round walls. We have different angle walls. We have, there's the only uh, rooms that are square, unfortunately, or, or more or less square, are the toilets in the, in the uh, dormitory. <laughs> toilets and showers. That's, that's about it. But everything else is different in shape. So we wanted a view because if you are obstructed by a lot of buildings around you, where's your vision? Right? You're getting, you're getting very narrow minded because, well, you're living in a narrow minded space. Right? So we have, we're on the lakeside here. Right now I see the beautiful Valdeari Lake right here. Uh, we have lots of trees. We are growing part of our own food. We have a food forest that we started. Um, the buildings are made out of mud, brick, and, uh, and rubble. Um, it's, it's all very, very open. We have, for a um, very simple thing, a lot of NGOs uh, are seen as, uh, you know, kind of, there's a lack, um, lack of trust towards NGOs. What is their agenda, etc. So from the beginning, we said we have to be very transparent in what we do. So our walls, and I can look right now, I see the outside wall, it's half brick and the top half is jolly. So anyone can look through and see in the campus what's happening. Our gate is, you know, it's planks like this, but it's open so you can look through and see what's happening in this place. Every single door, except for the toilets, half is glass. So you can look inside every room and see what's going on. These are all things that we thought of from the beginning. So we had this dream factory, you know, where we listed everything that we wanted Ecosand toilets, right? We want to be off the grid. We just put another uh, solar system on our roof and now we're feeding it into the grid, but we're nearly off the grid in that sense that we can supply our campus you know, with our own energy. We have Ecosand, we have the biogas, uh, we have an anti end channel, which I, I, this is an idea from Holland basically, where we love water, right? So we have a, a channel of water around the buildings so that ants and termites can't go inside to eat up the buildings, right? So, and it's a very uh, eco-friendly way to do it. And we pump the water through a, um, is it two pipes? And we just use the gravity to transport the water to the front of the campus. So we pump it up the, near the lakeside, up in the tree, it goes into a other uh, pipe that is underground, overflows at the entrance of the campus, and then it flows, slowly it flows back, you know, going like this around the building so the ants can't get in, into the buildings. Small things like that. It's, uh, we have, the campus was chosen as the second greenest campus in India in 2013 by Hutko. And since then, we, every year we have a few thousand architect students that are coming. And we always tell the, the, the visitors, we say there's no copyright on anything that's here on campus. There's a right to copy, please copy. <laughs> if you, you know, like, please share. And if you have any ideas that we can implement in our, into our campus so that they can be copied by other people somewhere else later on that are visiting, please send us and share us these ideas. I think it's all about sharing, right? So, well, anyone that would like to see the campus more, please come and have a look. <laughs> and the other thing is uh, on, on advice for the youth. I think um, I'm 52. And um, I've seen a bit of the world. I was in Tibet for 19 years where we ran our program for Build Our Borders. Uh, um, I've seen a lot of, you know, our students in Tibet, but also here at Kantari. At Kantari, till date now, we trained 226 uh, participants from 48 countries. Uh, they started more than 130 organizations and they're reaching thousands of people every day that are on the margins of society and they're positively impacting their lives. Um, my personal reflection of, of um, what, what I think is important for anyone is first to find out what it is that you want. That's the first thing. And don't let yourself be influenced by others, parents, brothers, sisters, society. It doesn't matter what they think. In the end, it's your life, right? It's your future. You have to walk in your shoes. Nobody else. It's nice to trying to put yourself in the shoes of anybody else, but you never understand that unless you're really in those shoes with everything that comes with it. And I think that's, a, that's the first thing. So think about what it is that you want. And then of course, finding ways how to transfer that into your own reality and, and make it happen. And I've, I've seen people here in our campus that came from the slums, they had nothing, or they came from the bush. They weren't even in school before they came here. 
right? And now they're running successful organization. Now, I don't say that everybody has to run a successful organization to succeed, but it shows that basically anything is possible in that sense, right? It's, it's if you have an idea and you are driven and you have an intrinsic drive to want to make it happen, it's incredible what all is possible, right? And, and people don't even know how strong they are, how much they are capable of doing. But the first thing is stop listening to all those naysayers. Stop listening to all those people that say, you cannot, you cannot, because they cannot. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you cannot, right? It's like, it's, it's, I don't think it's just, it's envy. Some people just are made to do certain things. And I see most successful people, they're not in it for money, for fame, for success. They're in it because they're passionate, right? And if you find your true passion at a young age, I think that's one of the biggest blessings that can happen to you because then you can focus the rest of your life, right? Um, on doing that. When I was little, we had a bakery and we were delivering bread and I was going with bread to the, um, to the old people's home. And a lot of those old people, they said, wow, well, if I would have been, if I would be young again, I would do this differently. One thing was traveling. A lot of them, they were, of course, it was the first world war, the second world war, that's what these people went through, right? So, and they never traveled. So I had the opportunity to travel. I can advise anyone, if you have an opportunity, and you don't have to go to, across the world, you can go to other villages to go, just explore the world around you, right? See what's going on behind that wall. Right? <laughs> and behind the next wall and, and talk to people. Right? That's one thing. And then once you've seen a little bit of the world, then you can make the decision of what it is that you really want. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That was an enlightening session with you. That piece of advice, I think uh, everyone would require. And um, with the life stories that connect so well, including racism, social issue, mindset of the people all over the world, irrespective of you know, any, any indifferences. So unfortunately, mm. that's the all, all time we have. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for meeting, making the time for us today. We enjoyed it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you so much. Nice Thank you. Bye. Bye.